Good morning and welcome back to the first session of our second day at the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, the 11th Z Jaipur Literature Festival. We are delighted to announce our first panel, which will be Hap Shippers, Nandita Das, Roli Keating, and Satish Gupta, who will all be in conversation with Sonjoy K. Roy. To introduce our panel, Sonjoy K. Roy is an entrepreneur of the arts, is the managing director of Teamwork Arts, which produces over 25 highly acclaimed performing arts, visual arts, and literary festivals across 40 cities, including the world's largest free literary gathering, the annual Z Jaipur Literature Festival. Thank you for coming again. Roy, a national awardee for the film Shah Janabad, The Twilight Years, is the founder trustee of Salam Balak Trust, working to provide support services for street and working children in the inner, inner city of Delhi. In 2011, the White House presented SBT, the US President's Committee of Arts and Humanity Award for an international organization. Roly Keating, who is also here with us today, has been chief executive of the British Library since September 2012. In his tenure, he has overseen a series of significant de developments, including the historic move to a large-scale digital collecting through legal deposit. The library's successful and popular 800th anniversary commemorations of Magna Carta, the creation of a national network of business and IP centers in major regional libraries, and the launch in 2015 of Living Knowledge, which sets out an ambitious vision and strategy for the library's growth and development towards its 50th anniversary in 2023. Satish Gupta is a painter, sculptor, poet, writer, printmaker, muralist, designer, and calligrapher. His works have been a deep engagement with mysticism and the Zen spirit. Gupta is known for his monumental copper sculptures. His works have been exhibited in many solo shows, including the Shanghai Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Sacred Arts Brussels, Prince of Wales Museum in Mumbai, and the Venice Bienn 2017. His writings have been published in English and Spanish and Catalan. Nandita Das has acted in more than 40 films in 10 different languages. She directed her first film, Firak, in 2008. She was in the jury of the Cannes Film Festival twice, amongst other words. She has been conferred the Knight of the Order of Arts and Letters by the French government. Nandita has been a strong advocate of social issues and is currently working on the life and works of Sadat Hussain, Hassan Manto. Hab Shippers has a long and deep engagement with traditional music and sustainability. Trained as a sitar player, he has led major projects across three continents in education, journalism, event management, the record business, and research, including a groundbreaking five-year exploration of musical ecosystems he now serves as director curator of the iconic label Smithsonian Folkways. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. A happy Republic Day for, to all of you, and thank you all for coming out uh, on this wonderful sunny morning to yet another, uh, what's hopefully going to be a wonderful day of conversations. I'm absolutely delighted that we were able to bring together such a wonderful panel. We are missing Saida. Um, and unfortunately, she wasn't granted her visa. She was supposed to come out from Pakistan. Uh, but because of our present political uh, situation between the two countries, and I'm going to ask Nandita a little bit about that in due course of time. Uh, but I want to just sort of put this into context. The world over, uh, culture is at a great threat. Uh, organizations like Daesh and ISIS have, as they stated policy, um, they put together a thing that they are going to destroy the very contours that a culture actually means. And that has created for many people in museums, which are considered to be somewhat sedate jobs and, and archivists, etc. They're now at the frontiers of one of the most difficult areas, which is primarily to preserve the culture and the tradition of the area, the built heritage of that area. And we are seeing that again and again across much of um, uh, 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 the Middle East and uh, across Libya and Iraq. Uh, the destruction has been enormous. This has not, is not new. I mean, if you look back just you know, in terms of, of India it, itself, and you look back to, say, the 11th century, where the invaders started coming in um, uh, from uh, from Mongolia and from uh, Turkey, etc. It is something that they too did. They defaced temples, they broke down, they created their own monuments. 
But much of that then passed, and today we are again stuck in a very difficult situation where we are having to deal with uh, people who are intent in putting a stamp on what they think is the only culture and making it again very monoistic mm. in, in a sense. I'm going to start with Hugh because Hugh has done um, a fabulous research and I would recommend that all of you Google and some of it is online. Um, and he's, he's been a sitar player as well for over 40, 40 years. years. Uh, so he understands the music traditions of both the West and the East. And I'm going to start off with <coughs> you. You know, in today's world, if you look at a place like India in today's Republic Day, so perhaps it's even more appropriate to look at it in that sense. We're a republic. We're made up of hundreds of dialects and uh, different cultural styles, and idioms, food and dress. Every hundred kilometer in India, everything changes, as you know. Uh, we're all in the same uh, place, certainly the three of us, but all three of us come from completely different backgrounds, languages, dialects, cultures, uh, cultures, etc. So, in that context, given that you know you studied uh, the sitar and you played the sitar, you played the sitar for forty years. How do you see that in the cultural context? Is it? I'm not going to use the word cultural appropriation because that's a whole different mm. politics. But I will ask you, how do you see the West and the East coming together and? And the influences that we have in today's day and age, all of us, we all watch the same kind of news, have access to the same kind of phone calls, etc. So how do you actually create something, or do we need to create something that's pure, and do we need to preserve it in, for the sake of its purity? I doubt it. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're living in absolutely fascinating times culturally where um, we're getting past the hegemony of Western culture, so um, coming from Europe, um, I, I'm afraid we'll have to admit that our cultural superiority was more based on, on uh, colonial superiority than on, on anything intrinsic. And I think we see, although we see terrifying things happening, not only here, but also in places like America, where I live now, in terms of cultural tolerance and cultural respect, we do see that we expect that we um, accept cultural diversity as a given now, that these, this, and that this, we're beginning to celebrate the richness of these cultural diversity. So what you describe, that every 100 kilometers you're in a different subculture or in a different mix of cultures is um, something that we have to celebrate rather than have to criticize or be, af be afraid of. At the same time, we have to realize that culture is constantly in flux and that, that the culture that we see as pure was actually a mixture of other cultures before. So we randomly refer to a particular point in time as authentic because that happens to be where we met an 84-year-old person who said this is authentic, who probably when he was 20 years old was decried by his, by his elders as saying, what are you doing? That's not the real tradition. So we, we live in a, in a time where we have to negotiate between uh, accepting change all the time, but at the same time, and in Indian classical music, that's a, that's a big discussion, trying to make sure that we keep the, the essence of, of, of the art. So while I was just hearing a, a sitar player in, in, in uh, Philaid Hani style, that's a very strong style. When I was learning sitar myself 40 years ago, there were five or six dominant styles, and now there's only two left. Which is, which is a sad thing in, in, in some, some way, but it's also something that happens, and out of those two styles, new styles will come again. So t 20 years or 40 years from now, people say, isn't that interesting? They only had two dominant styles at the time, and now there's four or five again. So what I did in my research, uh, which was a five-year project uh, with nine case studies across the world on understanding what, are, what forces work on any art practice, um, we found that um, there's five base, basic domains to look at. One is, is how um, the communities work within, within a culture, how education and learning and teaching works, how infrastructure and regulations influences it, how media and the music industry influence things, and probably most importantly, constructs. So the, the things that we think about art very often that make what, or about culture at large, make what we see as culture. So I, I doubt very much whether we'll get to a final de uh, definition on this is culture, but I think understanding its dynamics is probably more important at this moment than, than trying to define it and catch it in a, in a, static, uh, in a static way. Nandita, you, you know, what, 
it's fascinating and you know the reason we've called this culture curry is really to look at this whole expanse if you look at the uh, some of our classical dance forms bharatnatyam uh, uh, to be specific uh, bharatnatyam grew out of a temple tradition and all the way till the uh, 1950s that temple tradition was seen to be uh, women who were performing who were uh, not necessarily acceptable in regular society yet that entire dance uh, uh, form has now been taken on onto a stage onto a formal stage by some of the greatest dancers out of chennai uh, rukmini devi etc and that and everybody has forgotten in a sense where that tradition has the come dancers. from they have cut out uh, to some extent the passion that was associated to that form and today bharatnatyam to a large extent is seen to be primarily a very technical form because it went through this incredible change if you then look at bollywood or bollywood style of dancing which on the other hand represents this incredible thing of passion and sexuality and 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 teasing and it it is a new form of of dance in, in everybody hates it but it is a new form of, well everybody, everybody in culture in the cultural context it. hates it but so how do you see that working and as a you know i'm asking you i'm sorry i'm asking you this as a woman but in both this in the cultural context of that where is there going to be a balance does there need to be a balance or can all of this exist and do we need to find a, a marriage between the two well, there are too many questions in that in a way it's uh, culture <laughs> <laughs> i know exactly and that's why there is no this and that and the fact that many different things coexist and what you talked about the diversity and you started off as well with subcultures i think our need to define it itself is problematic because culture is so fluid it's constantly evolving it means different things to different people and and uh, and as you were saying that what we might think was old and pure you know people of that generation might say oh no 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 this has been completely destroyed 50 years ago that was what was pure so you know we are we are all in transition when we sometimes feel oh we are in transition that's why india is in such a mess because we don't know whether to hold on to the tradition or to look to the west and look to the modernity of things and when you see films of the 50s they say ye to bahut bure din hai you know i'm like really 50s were bad meaning, days <laughs> meaning these were very bad <laughs> these days are, these the are terrible times terrible time. but 1950s if you see the dialogues were just the same so <laughs> these are always the worst times and there were always these amazing times before <laughs> so i think culture therefore but, but but let me ask you a corollary to that your film firaq i don't know if any of you have seen firaq but if you haven't please go and see it it's a beautiful sensitively made film uh it derives much of its um uh 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 a uh, a uh, format it, from western culture and the reason i say that is unlike an indian film which is full of song and dance and so on and so forth you mean forth, mainstream mainstream, mainstream. film mm. it's devoid of that and it and in the telling of the story you've kept it very pure but in a perhaps more western cinema than indian cinema is would you would you say that no <laughs> sorry no but i don't think it's so it's so straight jacketed like this is in first of all indian cinema bollywood is not indian cinema you know the 40 films that the lady mentioned you would struggle to know five of my films because many of them are in different languages so it's bengali and malayalam and you know 10 different languages that i've worked in that's as much indian cinema as hindi cinema is So uh, Rashomon is a film from Japan by Akira Kurosawa which looks at the same situation with five different angles so i think anything that's outside our traditional indian setting we are thinking of it as the west but as you again rightly said that the cultures have mixed so much that there's nothing really pure and thank god for that you know because it's it's in that amalgamation that things are wonderful just going back to what you were talking about dance for instance even the carnatic music is extremely traditional it's it's coded it's almost it's like western symphony where you can you have a particular uh, composition and everybody in the audience can give the rhythm to carnatic music because everyone knows of that so you can retain it but along with it mainly it's the tam brahms as we call it the brahmins of tamil nadu that really were the bastions of that part of culture of 
traditional music. T.M. Krishna, one of our greatest Carnatic musicians of the times, he is trying to break that and say, why are there only Brahmins in this? I'm not going to sing in the music academy. I'm going to sing in some Outside far-flung places, in small community halls, in, you know, just, I'm, I'm going to break the tradition of keeping it so Brahminical, or the, the role that caste plays in it. So I think that is an evolution of culture, where you're sort of, anything that breaks, anything that's different makes us uncomfortable, because it's so much easier to hold on to the old and the known. You know, so, so let's come back to breaking of cultures, and mm -hmm. let me go to uh, Sadichi. Uh, for those of you who've been passing the Darbar Hall, the tree installation there has been done by one of our most eminent mm -hmm. installation artists. Uh, and um, it's always wonderful when he comes to anything that we do because I get to see him and get to spend time and understand his point of view. So DJ, what are the influences that has made you create the kinds of work uh, that you've done? And I'm going to ask, for, I know that it's not here, but the wings that you're going to be launching, uh, I think, next month. Yeah. Uh, you know, where is the iconography of that wings coming from? Is it Icarus? Uh, is it an Indian context? Is it the bird from the Ramayan? Um, well, my, my work is really rooted in India, um, traditional Indian. Um, it's greatly inspired by the Chola bronzes, the Chola pieces, and also the Southeast Asian um, uh, from Angkor, from um, Borabadu, from all these things. But it's. Um, it's just the inspiration. It's not something that I'm following rigidly. In fact, I'm breaking all the rules. I'm breaking all the thing, but keeping their sense. And I think that is what is precious, you know. If you just follow, okay, the figure should be this, the head should be this much, and the leg should be this much, and there's a very uh, exact um, uh, formula, and exact, as you were saying about the Carnatic music, you know, everything is um, specifically, um, uh, formulated mm -hmm. but I'm doing away with that and keeping really the what was the spirit which is the life giving force that is what is interests me and um, I'm doing away with the traditional method of uh, lost wax casting I've developed my own technique by which I have total freedom you know I can create things um, which are um, 23 feet high by 23 feet this is my some of my Sculptures are like that, but this sculpture that um, now is going to go on show at the art fair and it's going to be shown at the Swiss Embassy. It's a, it's a wing um, of just just pure flight, and it's um, also rooted in many images of the Garuda. Of course, that is in our uh, Hindu and the Buddhist uh, uh, tradition is um, <coughs> always there. It's, uh, he was. Uh, Vishnu's sort of uh, one of our one of our gods, uh, uh, one of the, the gods, one of the Indian Holy god, Trinity. the god of creation. Uh, he's a vehicle for uh, all our gods have vehicles, uh, their own Mercedes or Rolls Royces. So he was um, uh, the swing was something that transported him to many different realms. And I was also inspired by the Icarus, um, Icarus. Uh, story where um, our, that's what is happening in the world that we have, uh, we are reaching for the stars, we're reaching beyond to the quasars and we're exploring all the universe and the science is bringing us to, but we forget um, in our ego, we forget that we are human beings, you know, there is, so the Icarus uh, fall is a reminder uh, and the wings can melt and the wax can melt and we can be down to this. So that is what the inspiration So the Icarus fall is a reminder. Roli, uh, you know, chicken tikka masala is your national dish. <laughs> and like somebody said in a session yesterday, it's not about the empire strikes back, but it's about the empire <laughs> rights back right now. So, you know, so much has changed, especially in this last hundred years, uh, you know, uh, Britain in the way that it stood for cultural domination and imperialism, that has given way to a whole new mixing pot of, of, of curry. How do you view that from the UK? I know that there are many people who I meet 
uh, old school, especially in Scotland, who, send, who tend to want to push back against this larger, uh, you know, the great unwashed who sort of washed up on their shores and they're not quite sure how to deal with it. And it's not any more about uh, muffin and, and, and strawberry jam at tea time, but it's about chicken tikka. <laughs> I mean, how do you cope with that? Uh, 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 there's so many things to pick up on. I'm not sure the muffin and strawberry jam era actually existed for very long. But certainly in the books. total <laughs> British culture. Uh, and if you look at the whole span of the islands I live in, uh, it's been a tales of coming and going, collisions, invasions, multilingualism, uh, it being hard to tell where British Isles began, Europe began. So even long before the imperial phase, if you think about the archives we look after at the British Library, it has that fluidity that Nandita was talking about baked into the whole collection. You couldn't pretend to make the collection of the British Library into something pure mm -hmm. if you tried, because it's not that kind of thing. And li libraries are particularly, um, I think, helpful and generous if you think about culture there, because they tend to collect everything or try to and be comprehensive. So they're not about trying to determine this is high culture, this is low culture, this is the proper tradition, this isn't. Certainly at the British Library, you know, the, the great uh, um, capacity to try and draw in everything that gets published and written and recorded means that our task and privilege is to try and capture Britain and the world just as it is in all its contradiction and multilinguistic reality. And that involves British history. It involves, of course, stories of empire and culture. Uh, and now, I think it means for us, uh, we feel as an institution very much in tune with, with some of the, the spirit of this conversation. We, we encompass every language of the world in the digital age. We can share it. Others can share with people in the UK. Uh, the more global and complex and international we become, the more that chimes with audiences back home, because Britain is like that too. L London is a city where every language is spoken, where there are no hard boundaries. And I think, of course, that coincides with counter forces in the culture. You began this session with a, a dark picture about some of the grim forces that try and harden the edges, that even try and destroy things and so on. And we're very, very sensitive to that. And, it, and there are ripples of it, sure, in the UK. You have it here. Uh, but I think I'm probably slightly with some of the other speakers. I think history's always had that flow and tension in it. Uh, but I can only say partly through just the natural energy of artists and creators uh, on the one hand. And also, we might want to talk about this, how institutions globally do kind of maintain themselves through quietly keeping a common values going, whatever is happening with politics. I think you can get a bit of optimism out of that. So mm -hmm. culture is fluid, yeah. You know, I'm, it's amazing that I, I don't know if any of you have accessed the British Library in recent times. I mean, I've seen the most incredibly diverse exhibitions there. You've had Harry Potter, yeah. you've had <laughs> Shakespeare, you've had, uh, you've displayed the uh, wonderful, um, uh, the Magna Carta, Magna Carta and, uh, yeah. which, we were, we, which we were able to get a facsimile of it last year. Mm. But the role of the institution, I mean, I remember, uh, I don't know if any of you know where the Andaman Islands are, but it's in the Andaman Sea uh, at the bottom of India, um, sort of between Thailand and Sri Lanka, somewhere there, so imagine. And I was on an island called Havelock, absolutely stunning, amazing, sort of the Bali of India and undiscovered. And in this shop, when I walked in, I saw this statement by Lord Macaulay, where he says in 1837, he stored India and he goes back and he gives an address to British Parliament and he says, um, I have traveled the length and breadth of India and I haven't seen any poverty. I'm not sure what kind of India he saw then, but hey. <laughs> I haven't seen any poverty, there's only great wealth and richness, and much of the richness is their culture and tradition. And if we have to conquer these people, it cannot be like the way we've conquered the Africas or the Americas. We have to ensure that they understand 
that ours is a superior culture and ours is a superior language. Only then will we be able to break the back of these people. Therefore, in that light, uh, Roli, an institution today, and especially an institution in the UK that has everything from Elgin Marbles to the wonderful archives that the British Library has, what are the roles of these institutions to be able to preserve and perhaps tell a history, a history which today is being told by all sorts of different people somewhat differently? Well, I think it's, it's a very, very rich question to explore. I mean, the Smithsonian that you, you work for similarly has to, has to grapple with, with this. Um, uh, we're a, oddly enough, the British Library is the National Library of the UK, uh, but we were only actually created uh, in 1973. Strangely enough, it, there was the British Museum Library and the British Museum and the other collection, but only rather miraculously for all Britain's deep history did, did we actually create a national library. And I often say that gives us a very particular privilege because we can be old and new at the same time time and we're uh, uh, and we seize that opportunity I feel we're we're trying to forge an identity in a much more complex age we don't have great classical pillars people walk in through uh, so we can take in some of that complex history but try and create it and tell stories as you put it in a way that feel right for now um, and I, that's maybe a particular privilege to us, but I think it's true of the very, very best archives and museums all, all around the world in every country. And I think everyone who runs or cares about those institutions is constantly striking a good, cre if they can, a good creative balance between continuity, because continuity is important, you've talked about tradition, and you do want to have that scholarship, that sensitivity, uh, that gets it right and doesn't misrepresent the past and tries to understand. But increasingly, that coexists with a kind of generosity and curiosity, uh, an understanding that whatever tradition you look at, you care about, you can serve, it's one of thousands of other traditions that are in, in dialogue with each other. Uh, and more and more, I think, uh, museums, the best of them, and, and, and great libraries and archives, are, are, if you like, the architects of that dialogue. And it's a really important one because I think that's how civilizations evolve healthily, is getting that balance of deep continuity, but constant reinvention and, and dialogue. He said, you have to get it right. Nandita, you know, uh, 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 six years ago, we had um, we'd invited Salman Rushdie uh, here to speak at the festival, and there was a big broha, and it resulted with him canceling, and. Uh, there, was a, there was a time where 21 uh, uh, Muslim organizations came together to protest, and I was very keen to ha enter into a dialogue with them. Mm. And we set up this meeting with 21 of them, and 19 of the 21 agreed uh, to disagree with us. And they said, you know, we don't agree, we don't want him here, but we understand your need to invite him as an equal platform. Nandita, what struck me, and you know, I think I'm a liberal, I have friends from across the world, across languages, etc. But when I went into that meeting, uh, it struck me that our worlds actually never collide. I have no idea of how these people live, what they do, what they think. It's a completely different world. In your, in your film, Firak, and you talk about, you you've struggled and you've shown this incredible story of two different communities uh, who are being ripped asunder in a way. How were you able to make that, that leap? And how can we, in the context of today where there's schisms, not just in India, but across the world on religious lines, how do we find that, that connect? And how did you do that? Because you did it so sensitively. Well, for one, the example you gave of let's say, having to deal with very right-wing or let's say conservative orthodox Muslims who didn't want Salman Rushdie to come is, I think, different from what no, I happened wouldn't in say Gujarat. right-wing. I, I, it's, okay, it's let's, let's not say right-wing. Yeah, okay. right. Let's be politically they were, they, correct. It was just a different mindset. A different mindset. Okay. Now, uh, in Firak, it's more about the carnage that happened in Gujarat and it's a post and I'm I'm 
purposely using the word carnage and not a riot because you know, we have enough evidence to prove that it wasn't just a spontaneous combustion of violence that happened between two communities. I think the whole thing of them and us is different. It's not about religion. It's not about this is us and that is them. I think, firstly, I wish there wasn't a us and them, but if there has to be, and as you said rightly, that sometimes you meet people who have such different worldviews or such different mindsets, you feel like you're from another planet. But then who is that us and them? How do we define that us? Is it those who are secular? But you can be secular and then you find people, they are very, very sexist. So is that, you know, there, there are so many contradictions that we are dealing with. If we say, let's say, loosely, liberals. If we say liberals, even that has become a bad word. I mean, today we are struggling for words because they've all been co-opted and we are kind of almost hiding behind and not wanting to say words that have a lot of meaning. To be a secular is just a good thing. To be liberal is a good thing. But we almost don't want to use these words, especially I'm talking about the Indian context, because they've been abused so much. The word secular has become secular by some people. We almost want to say, listen, we don't want to be labeled. But the point is, we also are labeling them by saying that these are ideas, worldviews that we don't agree with, these are the orthodox, these are the conservatives, these are the non-liberals, then we'll have to define ourselves. So I think we are going through this transition, but we must not fall into the trap of them and us that have been defined on lines of religion, on lines of nationality, of language, because that's not the vocabulary of the liberal. So we, we want to also be careful how we define the us and them. I don't know if that answers your question, but... In fact, you, <coughs> us and them, you know, in the American context, because of JLF, we do JLF at Boulder, Colorado now, mm -hmm. which is a wow. very white uh, 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 <laughs> part of the neck of the woods. <laughs> and for us, it's been this enormous discovery because we are, we are discovering um, uh, Native American writing, we are discovering African Caribbean American writing, uh, 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 Latino writing, but in all of this discovery, we are, I certainly have been discovering more and more that there is very much in America the them, the them and the us. Mm. And there's very little, especially in the, in, in, in the Texases and the Minnesotas and the Minis Mississippis, et cetera, there isn't at all this culture curry. There isn't a melting pot. And I see very, very, very strong defined lines. And I was in a, at a lunch uh, in, in Dallas 10 days before your last presidential election. Mm -hmm. And uh, lots of very eminent people at the lunch, etc. And the discussion was about how they would never allow and they never ever wanted an African Negro to ever rule them. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was like, whoa. <laughs> you know, how do you see that playing <laughs> out? Or how have you seen that playing out, especially in the cultural context where the African, uh, African uh, American music is today a very dominant music, as it always was. If you look at jazz, if you look at the gospel tradition, if you look at new music that's come out, that's the energy. Your basketball players, for example, have to be willy-nilly, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, African American, as are many of your sports people, your baseball yeah. players. How does that sort of mix, and, and how do they still sort of stay apart? And of course, the Latin communities, which are more and more at risk with the present uh, dispensation. Mm. Um, I was quite shocked. I, I moved to America just less than, less than two years ago, and I'm in the supposedly enlightened East uh, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And to come into a city where 50% of the people are African-American <laughs> and 50% are of European descent, and to see that the economic divide is almost equal to the, racist, to, to the racial divide. It's literally across yeah. the railway track. Yeah. Behind yeah. the railway track, it's a different Washington. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a very uh, startling thing to see, 150 years after slavery was abolished, but they have an education system which is one of the most inequitable education systems in the world where education is paid from real estate taxes, so if you live in a housing estate, there's low real estate taxes, so your school has no money, 
while I was growing in, up in the Netherlands, people that came from disadvantaged environments got about twice as much money per student to get them up to the education level that we wanted. And there they have about half. That, so that's a factor four difference. And that perpetuates this, this division of things. There are, um, it's, 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 it's a shame that we see the rise of, of African Americans mostly through sports and through music. Of course, rap has now taken over. And dance. Uh, and, and dance. And, and dance and but dance. but it's, it's in very particular sectors uh, that, that we see, see that rise. Although there is a African-American rising middle class, which, which is engaging with culture in different ways. At the Smithsonian, which is the largest research museum and education complex in the world, we have, as one of our 19 museums, we have now the African-American History and Culture Museum, which opened uh, just last year, the year before, sorry, because it's 2018 now, 2016. And in that museum, and that, that, that goes back to what we're talking about institutions, the full history and the full contribution of African Americans to, to uh, American prosperity has also been shown. So American economy took off because of slavery and not because of anything else. So the, 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 the recognition that, that um, we did a few things that were wrong and going in that museum and seeing all the names of the Dutch slave ships doesn't really give me, put me in a position that we can judge, uh, judge freely either. But there's three floors there that tell a very harrowing story of, of uh, African-American history, and, but also how they contributed to the economy, and then the shift through the civil rights movement that led to a stage, but nowhere near where we are in much of Europe, where, where still many things are wrong, but in, at literary festivals in the Netherlands, it's usually Moroccan Dutch writers, Suriname Dutch writers, because they have more interesting things to say. And, and this is, so th we also have to realize that, that I think literature is a very good metaphor for where we are in culture, that people that have multiple cultural references, and you have this too, um, that they make more interesting things. So, so we see a real shift in literature, to a, a shift in, in, in music, a shift in dance, where particularly second and third generation people that come from other cultures drink in these different, different cultural influences and make things that are really, to me, they are really 21st century. Can I say something? Yes. I, I feel that the, the problem is not us and them. The problem is I and the rest. Because if we take ourselves to be separate from the rest of the universe and the rest of the environment, that's where the problem really begins. It's not I'm white and you're black or I'm Hindu and you're another religion. I think the separation of the self from the environment, from the, that's where the problem begins and that's where we have to tackle it. Give me one thing. Uh, Sadiji, you know, it, can or does art actually cut across boundaries? Absolutely. Can art uh, express itself irrespective of language, cultural differences, uh, Absolutely. religion, Absolutely. You know, I did a, I did a series uh, called The Cosmic Matrix uh, about 10 years back, and I was working precisely on this uh, thing that I was taking, um, I mean, all the religions are basically saying the same thing, not exactly in many different languages, different forms. And there are some basic differences also, you know, in the, but essentially what we are seeking is to go beyond ourselves. I think that is what religion, to merge with the divine in whatever form, whatever way. So I did this series where I painted Buddha, I painted Christ, I painted the 199 most beautiful names of Allah. Uh, I had as many religions and I used the, um, the symbols of uh, the religion, like the cross or the Om, very cliche, but still that was a way of entering the work. And um, I did this whole series. And when I went on display, you'll be surprised that, you know, people, it cut across all religion, all this thing. Um, a Christian has got my Buddha, a Muslim has got my Hindu work, so I was very pleased because that is where the art has reached beyond religion and beyond race and beyond all that. And I think that is something that we should, we should treasure from that. You were saying earlier. Well, actually, to, to, to build on that, because we've been building a theme here, and you raised it yourself, your feeling about there being even people you're in dialogue with where you can't understand. It feels very different, and, uh, and that, uh, that sense of there being others, communities alongside who feel alien or othered. And sometimes, as you say, it's not spontaneous. These divisions are being actively 
fostered, but, but culture, creative culture, storytelling in all its forms at its best can be the slow antidote to that. And I feel that really strongly it can be, even in, you were talking about Midwest America, and yes, these are very, these can be, we all, in parts of the world, there are very monocultural places, of course, uh, but actually the, some of the counterforce can indeed be the power and popularity of music uh, or storytelling. Maybe it's, it is ultimately literature deep down, but it can turn into film or television uh, and go right deep under people's skin into the culture and through that show other worlds that you couldn't otherwise imagine. And it, maybe it takes generations to really play through. I mean, my background was at the BBC, where we worried endlessly about using popular storytelling constantly to expose some bits of British or global culture to other bits, including liberals. You know, liberals can be as blinkered as, mm -hmm. as any other because we, we all bring our prejudices Absolutely. to bear, and great imaginative artists counteract that. Let me ask you one question and come to you. You know, Roly, the big F word, funding, so, <laughs> yeah, I was one, wondering which one it was going to be, but yes, all right, good. I'm just making a film so I know exactly what you're talking <laughs> about. Film is another good F word, yeah. Roly, really, as the whole industrial revolution uh, has come to pass to a large extent, and the fourth revolution is upon us, which is the knowledge revolution, yes. where culture we know plays one of the most dominant parts of that revolution, and that has to be the next new job creation next new big ideas, etc. Do governments and policy makers understand that? And if they do, in your understanding, why is there still no sense that they have to put in resources? To, uh, the, the statistics that I saw last night is that if you invest uh, 100 crores, which is... Uh, anybody? Money. 100 crores, how many dollars does that make? Uh, sort of uh, 10... Uh, Okay. About $15 million, you're able to create 10 jobs. If you're able to invest uh, 10 crores, which is roughly about a million and a half, you're able to create 100 jobs in the creative industry. Is there any understanding uh, of this? I don't know about in India. In, in, in the UK, there's, uh, what shall I say, there's growing conversation about it. There's an endless conversation about the knowledge economy and so on. Creative but, industries. Uh, and creative industries and so on. Love. But, but it takes a long time, I think, to translate into what I would call the really rich investment you're talking about. It, I think at, at, the, at, at a very important level, definitely there's a shift to an industrial economy uh, in the knowledge sciences, the data sciences, computer science, and so on. To that extent, you're absolutely right, brain power, analytics, and I think you are seeing industrial societies shift to that. I guess those of us in our kind of sectors, though, need to make a rather bigger case to say you can't just stop this at the, the what you traditionally call the hard sciences. We, at a library, our passion is about knowledge being indivisible and, and real leaps, transformations, including some of the ones we're talking about, come from not really accepting boundaries within knowledge itself. Uh, something utterly creative, something utterly... They need to talk to come each together. other. And I think getting governments and policy makers to think in that imaginative frame is we have a little bit further to go. But the best do, the best do, the best I'm get. going to still hold on to you and come back to this big... They need F a woman to balance the gender I'm thing, but don't give them enough time. <laughs> I'm going to give, go back to the whole F word for a second. Uh, uh, you know, uh, when uh, Trump came in, one of the things that you all did was try and cut the NEA funding from, uh, from 157 or 150 million dollars to zero. Yeah. And I remember uh, the, uh, the Senate committee got a few of us together, five of us, and we had 20 minutes to make a presentation. And one of the things that I said is that, so what would you like uh, America to be known for? Hmm. If you cut out culture, it'll only be known for its gun <laughs> culture. Mm -hmm. And then they then voted uh, 157. Is that enough? How does America work? And how do institutions like yours work when it comes to funding? Um, 
We're not unlucky. So we, 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 we turn over about $1.4 billion as the Smithsonian, which is a good amount of money uh, but for which we run these, these, these 19 museums, nine research centers, and a zoo. Um, and just over half of that comes from, from Congress, and the other half comes from our own trust. Uh, mm -hmm. A little bit under half comes from, from the trust. In general, the American situation for funding for the arts is really quite different. So the 150 million that, that the NEA had, and they probably won't be cut completely because it's politically not, not it's 157 feasible. 157 now. They voted 157. Yeah, so, so um, uh, that, that was kind of uh, just a stab of Trump saying, I don't really like what you're doing. You have left-leaning left artists, and we're going to punish you for that. So in, in the total turnover of the arts, that's absolutely nothing. I was in the Dutch, in the Netherlands uh, National Arts, arts Council, and for 17 million people, we had much more money than the 362 million people get uh, from, the, from the government in America because philanthropy and corporate sponsorship are the big drivers of culture there. So the, the Met drives on, on philanthropy. It does not drive on, on, and on tickets rather than on, on, uh, on government subsidies. So every country has a different cultural landscape. And, and in India, for actually, if you look at Indian music, it's strikingly unfunded by the government. So there's very little money from Thanks the government. <laughs> well, the, in, in, in terms, of, for other reasons, in terms yeah. of sustainability, uh, I, I compared it in, my, 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 in, my, my, in, in our work to uh, Western opera, which looks like this strong art form. But if you take the subsidy away from Western opera, it just falls and flat on its ass. And it, kill, killing Indian music is almost impossible because it has hundreds and hundreds of pockets of support. So with, with, one, with three well-directed bombs, you can, you can get rid of opera in, in, in most Western countries. You would need hundreds and hundreds of bombs to, to, to get rid of, uh, of just Hindustani music. And we're not even talking about Carnatic music. Uh, sure. So it's, when, we, when, we, when I talk about eco ecology of, 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 of arts practices, um, I think the best thing we can do also in, in, in the, the context of um, ISIS, of wars, of famines, is to really understand what kind of forces work on each particular practice, whether it's making a film or making a sculpture or running a, running a library, and trying to analyze that very carefully and make strategic decisions on how to move forward, which include getting enough money so that you can do your stuff. Nadita, apart from your reacting to what you wanted to, what I wanted to Which ask I've you Which I've lost was, the thought anyways. Lost, <laughs> what I wanted to ask you, you know, again, when it comes, the films that you make, uh, you're making Manto now, you made Firak, the films that you've chosen to act in, with, be it in Fire or so many others, each of them have struggled because they're not necessarily mainstream in the way that we understand mainstream. As Hube said, you know, Indian, not just Indian music here, but Indian dance, yeah, Indian yeah, music. Yeah. India is one of the few countries where our uh, traditional forms of art, our uh, classical forms of art, are alive and kicking in spite of what every newspaper wants to talk about, that it's dying. It's not dying. Mm -hmm. Every guru has a little uh, a dance place in their garage, and across the diaspora and across the length and breadth of the country, you have young people wanting to go and learn their Kathak, wanting to learn their Bharatanatyam, wanting to pick up the sitar, in spite of all these differences. Should, in this context, um, should we be looking to government to support? I mean, my own, I'll give you an example of this. <coughs> uh, for the first four years, we never took money from government, and I remember Bina Kak, who was the then minister, went up to Punita, my wife, and said that, you know, he's... He, he's really putting us into a lot of trouble by not taking money. And I used to say, you know, with your money comes a lot of problems. So, <laughs> you know, you paint the streets, make the roads, blah, 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 <laughs> because of the kind of control. And then, you know, there's a particular domination. How do you see that happening? And, and what do you think the need of the hour? Because the easy thing is, <clears throat> you know, go out there and, and expect that somebody will fund. But we know that that's not necessarily how it happens. But art has always needed patrons. I mean, it's, you know, whether you take it from the government or you take it from Z, you know, I mean, that's, <laughs> is that a better choice? So you're between a big corporation and are there not compromises? And in a way, government should be our represent, I mean, government is meant to be ours. It's our tax money. They are supposed to put money in culture. I don't think there's anything wrong as long as you're not having to compromise. I mean. Britain is able to make some amazing films because there's BFI and a whole lot of other institutions that has funded. 
NFDC had that mandate, used to do that. Today, the more independent cinema is struggling because in our country, economics interferes with art all the time. The idea of the government being that, okay, you're not only doing it for profit making, <clears throat> although every project is commercial, you want your money back, but you will also do films that may not be sort of so commercial, may not be so mainstream, but need, those stories need to be told. So I am not against the government funding it as long as you can do it with freedom, but I'm sure there are more compromises that people have to make when they take corporate money. Because for them, it's like, what am I really getting in the bargain? And now that you've allowed me to speak, I'm also going to, now that I'm reminded, <laughs> there are two things that I do want to put out in the table. One is just to take your thought further that art, the reason why art is so powerful is because it does go into our subconscious in a very subliminal way. It's not didactic, it's not, I mean, at least good art doesn't tell you this is how you should think, this is how you should behave. It so subliminally goes into our subconscious that everything that you and I are, we are a product of everything that we have seen, the books we've read, the films we have watched. And if art wasn't powerful, then the conservative, the orthodox, the right wing, whatever you call it, the cultural custodians that we have today wouldn't be threatened. What can a two hour film do after all? The reason they are threatened because they know that it has the power. And the other thought that I was when he asked you about the African American and the divides, in our own country, look at what we have done to the Dalits. We've completely pushed them to the margins. It's very easy for me. Dalits are a marginalized community uh, the across, lowest the length, across the length and breadth of the And country. you know, people like us who are more privileged, who come largely from comparatively upper castes, it's very easy for me or for Sanjoy to say, we are not casteists. I don't think about my caste. And I generally don't. I didn't grow up talking about caste. But when you're so privileged, you don't need to worry about it. Why should I worry about something that is a given for me? When I'm in the schools, the colleges, my workspace, when there are no Dalits that I really interact with, it's very convenient for me not to think about them. So I, I Satish ji, I do feel there is an us in them because if it was just me and the others, then it's, it's a more spiritual journey. But I'm talking about when I see myself as part of people like me, I do create a little universe of people that I think are like me. Who are privileged, taking, who taking are... Taking that further, when you're saying, okay, Dalit is a um, um, thing which is sidelined and all that, Marginal but marginalized. marginalized, but the same thing happens within the Dalits, within, because a lower rung, that's so deeply rooted in that's, our... That's a human know, that's psychology so deeply to rooted. keep having subsets and all, but I'm saying on a larger scale, yeah. what we have done to the tribals, how we have tried to homogenize, how we... I think when a majoritarian authoritarianism happens, any kind of authoritarian system is wrong, but when a majoritarian authoritarianism happens, then you push back a lot of these cultures that you don't celebrate that diversity. You try to homogenize it. So what we've done to the Dalits, what we've done to the tribals, what we've done to the Muslims, you were talking about the kind of areas which is a very divided area. You go to Muslim neighborhoods, whether in uh, Ahmedabad in Juhapura, or you go to Bombay in Nakpara, or you go to any part of the country, their municipality, their roads, the schools that exist there are deplorable. So we have created these lines and some of us who are more privileged are that in the decision-making space are deciding what culture ought to be. And I think that's extremely problematic. And, and, and that wanting to define culture on our terms is where the problem really begins. And that's where the government can play a role. That's where artists can play a role. That's where corporations by funding events like this can play a role. Let me open. Let yeah. me open it. Let me open it up. Uh, <laughs> of course, there are hundreds of questions still waiting to be asked and answered, and I think we can, can continue forever. But let me. Any questions in the audience? Otherwise, so let's take one here and then one at the back. And uh, so this question is open to all of you. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that cultures have transformed from a sense of belonging to a sense of identity. 
Because in the earlier times, when cultures were developing in isolation from one another, it helped people belong together. It helped people trust each other. But when uh, we see so many different cultures sitting under one tent, you tend to think of culture as a sense of identity. And that creates problem because it, it often gets radicalized. So how do we bring back the sense of belonging to cultures from the sense of identity? Sense of belonging to cultures from sense of identity. Let's just hold that and we'll come back to you to answer that. Let's take one more question. That's an interesting question. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Nandita, you were talking. Hold it closer to you, closer, please. please. Uh, Nandita, you were talking about uh, how films that you do, mostly uh, art films, and you talked about how the government does not fund these projects. But I do not believe that that is the only problem. Why is your kind of cinema not considered mainstream? Because that is more of a people's belief, right? Because people want action films, films that have uh, scenes of people kissing each other. They do not want the real truth. Number one is that, that people do not want to see these films because they do not consider it mainstream. Secondly, the people, the censors, do not wish to get, let your films get promoted because they tap into things that society wants to remain under the covers. For example, female sexuality. So they, they, they do not want that to be propagated either. So do you not believe that a mindset change is required rather than just So mindset funding? change and, and about mainstream. So let's, let's first go to you for the first uh, question. Yeah, that's a very big and complicated question uh, that, you, that you asked. Um, I think we, we have seen a shift from, from cultures of belonging when, when communities were re relatively more isolated to the, the, the state that we discussed before where we're actually part of many different cultures. So I think, and this is why we say uh, we define our identity by the cultures that we identify with, by the communities we identify with. Meanwhile, in the way we've organized our um, as nation states, we've come to a place where uh, we have this strong sense of individuality, particularly in the West, and then a strong sense of state. So we've, and the middle bit, which is community, has kind of um, eroded over, over time. What I'm seeing at the moment is a revaluing of community. I think people are, are buying into the idea of being part of communities, whether they are physical communities or geographical communities or communities of practice or digital communities, which are becoming very real places where people share things with each other. So I think we've come to a place where there's many overlapping circles where there is a sense of belonging and the, co the com combination of all these belongings create, create, create a sense of identity. It's much more complicated than it was 100 years ago. But I think the way we're thinking about it and the, the way we're moving about it, uh, we're moving on it, is, gives me some, some hope for, for a more, a fairer world with more awareness and, and, and more respect between cultures. So just to uh, clarify, firstly, it wasn't about only government. It was just that government too needs to participate in the evolution of, uh, of the arts. Uh, you talked about the mindset, of course, that is the most important thing, but how do you change that mindset? It's a chicken and egg situation. We can't keep waiting. Art has a role in changing that mindset. And I believe that audiences want to be engaged. We have narrowed the definition of cinema by calling it, it's a form of entertainment. What may entertain me may not entertain you. That kind of relief that you're talking about, the mainstream films, is not what I grew up with, so it doesn't actually entertain me. And sometimes it's also our arrogance that we think we understand this art cinema, independent cinema. The person out there is not going to understand. The sad thing is these kind of films don't get proper producers and distribution and therefore they don't reach to the masses, so to say. And that's why we, it's not a level playing field at all. And I do believe a good engaging film, it may may not have songs, it may, be, it may may not have action, it may may not have songs. If it's well made, if it stirs the mind, touches the heart and has something interesting to say and is, you know, the story is told beautifully, every person will relate to it. And that's why even Manto that I'm making, I want to make it accessible. I don't want to make it a festival film and for us converts or whatever you call it, it's for everybody because I do believe good cinema will reach out to everyone. One last question and... Uh... 
Sorry, you you had also asked a question, raised your hand, right? Uh, mm -hmm. No, let, let let her ask, let her ask, and then we'll take that. Go ahead. Uh, good Keep morning, everyone. <coughs> Keep it short. Yes. Uh, good morning. My name is Kathy. My question is for Nandita, ma'am. Uh, uh, do you think restriction is uh, needed in art forms like cinema Sorry? because it caters? Do you think restrictions are needed in art forms oh. like cinema? Thanks. Quick question. Good morning. My question is. What makes up a rich culture? What are the common footholds I can find across many ways of life? What makes up a rich culture? Sorry, and then I'll, I'll go slower. My question to you is, what actually makes up a rich culture? What are the common footholds I can find across many ways of life? And what paradigm can I use to understand them all? I didn't get that. Well, what makes up for a rich culture and what paradigms we I mean, that's like, to like, that will take okay, about okay. three sessions okay, yes. <laughs> across ten venues, <laughs> across five days to even come to the first point of it. So we're going to hold that and take that off stage that you can answer. Uh, you, I mean, in the first question, I mean, this whole thing of freedom of expression, which has become such an important topic today, requires another full session. <laughs> but uh, to broadly say that I think art can flourish when there is freedom to create art. Now, I know you would say, but what about the responsibility of art, right? Um, okay. It's not a propaganda. Sit, sit, sit. If you want to tell a story that I completely disagree with, I must give you the freedom to tell that story. It doesn't mean I'm only saying that to listen to my story. And I do believe that if we have enough voices, we've got to trust ourselves and others. That a kind, a more discerning point of view will emerge from that, and the one that truly stands the test of time will survive, and the rest will go. And today, with the internet, in any case, there is freedom. There's no censorship on the internet. So better content, interesting content, rubbish content is all happening on the internet. And then slowly you will choose the good out of the bad. That's just the short answer. But yes, we can talk about that too for a long time. Having zero, zero, that, zero, zero. Having said that, there is <laughs> a censorship on the internet. But yes. Well, but much we, lesser. And maybe it will Well, go if you there. look at China, for example, they Yeah, but I'm talking about in our country. Yeah, you sure, can still sure, find a sure. lot more there. So We'd love to have continued. Yes. And we need to do this perhaps in the green room or whatever. I don't think we've <laughs> even begun discovering or exploring uh, this wonderful topic. But thank you all so much for being here. Uh, together. Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of the day.